Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Perry Renshaw will present Life Elevated, Examining Altitude-Related Effects on Mental Illness. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $346 million. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Perry Renshaw. Dr. Renshaw is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Utah School of Medicine and medical director at the Rocky Mountain Network for Mental Illness Research, Education, and Clinical Center for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Prior to joining the University of Utah, Dr. Renshaw was director of the McLean Hospital Brain Imaging Center and was on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Renshaw is a three-time foundation grantee, recipient of the 2001 Clearman Prize for exceptional clinical research by a young investigator and is a member of the Foundation Scientific Council. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Renshaw's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel of your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Renshaw and will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Perry Renshaw. Perry, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank you everyone who's uh, listening. Uh, there, let's see. So can you see, I guess you can see my screen. Perfect. Yep. Less. Okay. Mm -hmm. And get rid of this. And uh, my charge this afternoon is to talk uh, a little bit about Utah, which is uh, an interesting place. A little bit like about depression and, and how they come together. And um, as you heard from uh, Jeff's introduction, uh, my wife and I moved from Boston to Salt Lake City uh, in 2008. And uh, I guess you know you've made it in your new town when. Uh, the local political cartoonist decides to make fun of your research. So we're starting with um, probably the high point of my scientific career, having been recognized by the general uh, uh, public. <laughs> uh, let's see. I click on the slide. I am clicking on the slides. Uh, Oh, or, uh, yep. Okay, so uh, I would like to start off by giving different perspectives on depression. And um, if you ask the World Health Organization about uh, disabling illnesses in North America, the answer you get is that far and away unipolar depression is the, the most morbid uh, disorder of all. And this is, I think, a, a very useful perspective. However, here in the state of Utah, we uh, reserve the right not to honor uh, federal or international opinion and sort of go our own ways. And so you see this recent cover from Salt Lake Magazine where a man named Robert Redford, who could be seen as an actor, director, or activist, is recognized most importantly for being a Utahan. And that's uh, what a citizen of Utah is. Uh, and so as you, or as I, have had the opportunity to speak with uh, more natives of uh, my adopted state, uh, we get a diverse view of what depression is and isn't. Uh, a prevailing local view is that it really isn't an illness so much as a failure of will and that you should get back uh, on your feet, pull up your uh, suspenders and get back to work. And this view, which uh, sort of flies in the face of what we were taught in psychiatry residencies on the East Coast, is even supported by this uh, magazine from my own healthcare system. And the argument is that you can simply choose to be happy. Uh, if that were the case, the, the following slide would probably not be true. 
Uh, this is a map of the, the United States looking at uh, four different measures of distress, depressive episodes, psychological distress, and suicide rates. And Utah, if you're from not from the United States, is right here, uh, an almost rectangular state with a little bit cut out uh, so that uh, Wyoming can fit in. And you'll see that Utah is black in all of these slides, and so if you combine these and come up with a depression index, uh, one concludes that Utah has the worst problem with depression of any other state. Um, so very, very, very different perspectives on what depression is and isn't. There are things that are more objective, like the following slide that notes that close to 20% or actually over 20% of women in our state are taking antidepressants on a regular basis and over 10% of men are doing the same. And so we know we use a lot of antidepressants. Some people think we have a big depression problem. Uh, other people don't believe it's an illness and it becomes a very fascinating problem to try and disentangle. Uh, I live about five miles from my office and these are the owls I see each morning watching to see if I've made any progress in my research. Uh, as you can see, they look sort of skeptical. Um, any researcher depends on their colleagues and in my case that's probably more true than uh, many other investigators. So before I get too far into this, I'd especially like to acknowledge Doug Kondo, Shami Kanakar, and Brent Caius, who've done some of the, the studies that we'll be talking about today. Uh, and of course, uh, research is expensive. We've heard about the wonderful work that uh, the BBRF and formerly NARSAT has done and really giving young investigators like uh, myself a chance to uh, test some of our ideas. It turns out to be a bit tricky to get uh, funding to study a, a regional problem such as depression in Utah, but we've been very fortunate in getting support from the University of Utah from a state program called USTAR, the Utah Science, Technology and Research Initiative. And perhaps surprisingly, the uh, Veterans Administration uh, healthcare system, and particularly the Rocky Mountain uh, MIREC. And that's made uh, all that you're going to see coming up uh, possible, for better or for worse. This is a little bit about my trajectory. I was uh, in Boston for oh, 15 or 16 years when uh, we had an opportunity to move to the state of Utah and get some state support for our work. and. Uh, I traded one professorship for another back in uh, July of 2008. As part of that transition, uh, I had accepted an appointment at the Salt Lake City VA where the MIREC had an assigned focus of suicide research and I was asked to think about how would someone like myself with training in psychiatry uh, and in biophysics uh, add something to the debate or the discussion about suicide. Um, so investigators live complicated lives, uh, just to give you all fair warning so that you can uh, uh, quit and discuss early on in the presentation, uh, I was brought to the state of Utah by a state program that would like us to develop companies and jobs. So as part of my academic work, I file uh, patents, I do work with companies, uh, I don't pitch any particular proprietary products that I'm aware of. Uh, for the good of uh, humanity, I don't practice clinically. But a long time ago, I completed my general psychiatry residency in Boston. Uh, some of the companies I've worked with, I don't think any has been uh, helped very much by my assistance, but they sometimes call and ask questions. Okay, so that's a preamble. Uh, if you're willing to stay on despite my commercial overlap, let's see how this goes. Uh, so depression is controversial in Utah. One thing that's not controversial is that um, we have a lot of uh, suicides. Uh, in fact, in the state, our rate is almost 40% higher than that of the national average. And every year or so, uh, there'll be an article in the paper that comes out that examines this. Um, this in and of itself was sort of a fascinating thing uh, because uh, Salt Lake City is the most pretty city or the most beautiful place I've ever lived. And when we started poking about asking, you know, why would there be so much suicide in Salt Lake City? Uh, one view that I think is probably true is that Utahns own a lot of guns and take pride uh, of, in gun ownership and hunting. Uh, and that's certainly a risk factor for suicide. Uh, another published view was that uh, the West in general, and Utah in particular, is uh, notable for wide open spaces. That uh, what you see is downtown Salt Lake City, which is not all that big a metropolitan uh, area, but lots of open spaces going up into the mountains. Uh, as a physicist, though, I was very interested in the fact that um, 
Salt Lake City, when you get off the airport at 4,300 feet in altitude, leaves people short of breath with headaches, not feeling well for a day or two. Uh, that going up in altitude to that extent with the thinner air that we have here certainly makes you uncomfortable. Uh, and that, that might have something to do with uh, suicide rates. So being imagers, we were good at measuring things. We uh, used data from NASA to measure uh, the average elevation of every county in the continental United States and then asked whether there is a relationship uh, or not um, with suicide rates. Uh, this is the data that we uh, observed with a correlation coefficient of about 0 0.5 uh, and pretty compelling data. Uh, if you looked at this statistically and asked you know, how likely was this to be uh, true, this was statistically significant at 10 to the minus 178th. So unless we've made some horrific error in calculating altitudes, this is, is probably a really important factor. What does 0.5 mean in terms of a correlation coefficient? Well, if you multiply 0 0.5 by, by 0 0.5, you come up with 25%. And uh, this seems to be the amount of variation in suicide rates across the United States that could be uh, attributed to altitude, uh, at least uh, mathematically. And this is particularly interesting because uh, in folklore and in fact in truth, mountain dwellers are actually uh, long-lived and generally healthy. And amazingly enough, despite our thin air, even if you've had a heart attack or COPD or coronary artery disease, um, you are likely to live longer if you live uh, at elevation. So all cause mortality, that is death by any means, uh, it goes down strikingly as you go up in altitude. So well, we have more suicide, we have less less death than could be expected in any given age, which is a surprising uh, sort of thing. And just to convince you that I'm not making this up, uh, I've gotten some figures that were shared with me by a colleague uh, uh, in the uh, active uh, service. Uh, and this looks at all-cause mortality. And you can see that the yellow rates, which are pervasive across the Rocky Mountain states, are, have the lowest deaths per kilometer squared. Uh, sort of a funny unit, but uh, it clears out in the inner mountain west in terms of rates of death. And you can pick individual diseases if you want. So the next slide, or the one you're looking at now, shows what happens with heart disease. Again, Utah, the state that wants to be a rectangle but uh, which isn't, uh, is less less red than the areas that have higher rates of death. Even more striking is you can look at cancer as well. And here what you see is Again, the Intermountain West just uh, apparently doesn't have a lot of cancer, uh, which is something that has puzzled people over time. And we have less smoking, we have less lung cancer. Uh, so something about life at altitude or in the thin air has positive health effects. So much so that if we look at this uh, slide, which looks at not at illness but at, uh, at happiness, uh, Utah shown here as well as Nevada, Colorado, and Idaho, quite consistently the happiest states in the United States except for Hawaii, which somehow always wins the poll as to having uh, residents who are very, very happy. We call this uh, the Utah paradox, that is we seem to lead the nation in terms of rates of suicide, but also lead the nation in terms of being happy where we are. And, and you know, how do we put that all together? How can you be both happy and sad as a population at the same time? And depending on uh, how fast I speak and how much you're tolerant, we may get an answer to that as this goes along. How important is altitude as a risk factor for suicide? Um, when we were first trying to publish our data in 2008, there was a lot of skepticism and we were asked to do lots of comparisons and look at lots of different other things that might be confounding our results. And in this slide you see a bunch of risk and protective factors for and against suicide. Uh, and altitude it turns out to be the, the second most powerful risk factor for explaining variation in suicide rates, which is probably the reason why we as non-epidemiologists were able to tumble onto it so easily. Uh, another scientist who's worked in this area uh, is Barry Brenner, uh, who is now at uh, Case Western Reserve University. And he used basically the same data that we did, publicly available through the CDC, to ask the question, sort of, how high is high? That is, when do suicide rates begin to really skyrocket? And it turns out that it's, it's right around 2,000 feet, that if you look at this curve, you see toward the end of it, things start to go up. And that's really the threshold where we begin to see these effects. Now, 2,000 feet is an interesting number. 
uh, because uh, physiologists, and once upon a time we had a department of physiology at the University of Utah, uh, tell us that right at that altitude is where you can begin to do uh, aerobic training for athletics. That is, that's the point at which your body is not able to extract increasing amounts of oxygen to fuel your metabolic work. Uh, and so this really comes together as being a key point for oxygen availability and utilization looked at uh, from a number of different perspectives. That's suicide. Can we take a next step and uh, move from suicide to depression in altitude? And uh, not surprisingly, there wasn't a lot of work that had been done in this area. Um, but nonetheless, if you uh, work with CDC data and rearrange things a little bit, you can show that uh, Indeed, as you go up uh, in altitude, uh, rates of depression go up as well. Uh, there's been a lot of local interest uh, in uh, our research, which is always gratifying when you're a scientist. And so we've gotten a lot of email in response to what people think about our research. And you can see on this slide that there are a lot of people who thought it was sort of interesting. Perhaps we could help them. They wanted to share their experiences as well as uh, an equally uh, vocal number of people who um, thought that uh, we were just uh, out to lunch and probably should uh, have chosen a different career path or at least research topic. But the wonderful thing about the email that we've got is we've got uh, responses from individuals who've talked to us about their experience of mood changing with altitude. And it's really very interesting. Uh, here's uh, an email we received from a gentleman who lived at 7,500 feet in New Mexico and uh, would have to travel to Southern California for work. And what he found was that when he went home, you know, usually something we look forward to, uh, he tended to fall into a deep depression. Uh, he subsequently moved from New Mexico to Chicago and got treatment for depression. Uh, and that in this instance, what he found was that when he went back up to altitude visiting New, uh, New Mexico, within a couple of days, he began to feel like his antidepressant wasn't working, uh, exactly the same sort of experience he had when he had missed a dose uh, at other points in his life. And so in, in his experience, uh, medical or medication withdrawal symptoms are very similar to the effects of altitude in terms of changing how antidepressants work. A similar sort of story about a gentleman who also travels a lot. Um, this person noticed that when they travel to Hawaii, California, Seattle, or even Boise, they're much happier than when they go to higher altitude places such as Bozeman, Grand Junction, Denver, and Island Park. Uh, this person's experience of his symptoms was that, uh, you know, perhaps what he had was a variant of chronic fatigue syndrome, but that these are changes in mood that can come on very quickly. Now, you might think that these are sort of subtle effects, but uh, indeed we have a number of uh, messages from people who say that they moved to Utah and uh, within very short order began feeling suicidal. And so this is a, a note from a gentleman who uh, first came to Provo, Utah to train to be a missionary and uh, in living in Utah has had much more suicidality than he identifies in other places. So, so very interesting stories about mood changing a great deal, not always for the good, associated with traveling up and down in altitude. And uh, so putting this all together, uh, this slide shows our simple model and uh, all that it really says is that uh, the air gets thinner as you go up in altitude. At the University of Utah, our, your body thinks that there might be 15% less oxygen than if you were in San Diego or in Boston or in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina. Back in 2008, when we tried to report our data, we got uh, a spectacular number of rejections uh, before our work was accepted. Subsequent to that, just to you know, maybe keep you interested, uh, similar findings have been reported out of South Korea, Austria, Spain, Saudi Arabia, Chile, and Peru, uh, suggesting that uh, this is a physiologic effect, but uh, not necessarily something that you can blame on uh, a particular type of culture or lifestyle, given the wide number of places and ethnicities of uh, the local populace where this has been observed. Uh, we have three sorts of changes in biology that we study to try and explain what might be going on. Uh, one is probably the uh, oldest energy transfer system uh, in any animal or cell, something called creatine kinase that has been around for millennia. Uh, and phosphocreatine is a high energy compound that helps to regenerate and keep levels of adenosine triphosphate stable. Uh, the second square on the bottom talks about the fact that um, 
the synthesis of serotonin uh, in your brain, 5-HT is a, an acronym for serotonin, uh, goes down tremendously when oxygen is reduced. Uh, and as far as I can tell, the, the first person to look and think about this in any depth was a man named Ira Katz, who was then at Penn and who subsequently played a major role in providing leadership to the Veterans Administration uh, mental health uh, efforts. Uh, Ira himself, the last time I spoke with him, didn't think that it was all that significant and he'd moved on to other research problems, but uh, uh, we thought there was something there. And then again, a third thing that could happen that we think is more related to why so many Utahns are happy fools is that uh, the effects of hypoxia are to decrease serotonin but to increase dopamine. And as time allows, we may be able to talk about all of those three factors. But uh, our research has made most headway so far in talking about creatine and energy metabolism, and so we'll start there. Uh, just to prove that I'm not making up these articles from faraway places, this was a 2014 article in the Medical Journal of Cairo University showing that uh, depression and suicide uh, increased as you went to a higher altitude city versus a lower altitude city. Uh, this is going to work much better if you speak uh, Spanish. But you can see within the region of Spain called Andalusia, uh, rates of depression and of suicide go up with altitude as well. So it doesn't really matter where you look. If you have a, uh, a very well-collected data set, you come to the same idea that going up in the mountains has some negative effect on mental health. Uh, thin air. Uh, we can't really tell it's thin by walking around in it or waving our, our hands. But if we were to measure the... Um, equivalent concentration of oxygen at 4,000 feet or critically at 5,000 feet where my house is, uh, your body thinks you're walking around in an environment that has 17% less oxygen. Uh, and so that's why, uh, for example, if you're a presidential candidate and you fly into Colorado for a debate, you, you may stop making sense until you've had a chance to equilibrate to the altitude. Uh, or you may get headaches or you may not feel well. Uh, and I think many people who've come to high altitude places have had some experience with altitude sickness and we're adding to the existing literature uh, the possible mood symptoms. Uh, I actually do have a day job, something that uh, continues to impress and mystify my parents. Um, and what I do here is collect data like uh, you see here. Uh, I work with a very fine physicist, a man named Andy Prescott, and this is how he likes to look at brain chemistry. Personally, I think that uh, that's not so because I have trouble interpreting this. And if we re rearrange the same data, we can look at very specific chemicals. And so this was a study we did over about a year and a half looking at brain chemistry in Salt Lake City at 43,000 feet, uh, Boston at uh, 12 feet above sea level, and subsequently at Charleston, South Carolina. And what you can see here is that in the frontal cortex, there's a blue circle uh, showing that that your brain's concentration of creatine and phosphocreatine is almost 15% lower if you happen to live in Salt Lake City versus Boston. Uh, that's true in the frontal part of the brain. That is not so much true in the back part of the brain. But as far as we know, the frontal parts of the brain are most directly related to the symptoms of depression. Uh, I will subject you to just a little more chemistry. Um, this, again, is the, the type of work that we do, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Uh, and this is this very old energy equation showing that phosphocreatine or PCR2 minus can be used to rapidly make ATP or adenosine triphosphate, which is the sort of bioenergetic money of the brain used to fuel the vast majority of uh, things that your brain thinks it should be doing or that you would like your brain to do. Um, so I finished my residency. Uh, uh, in Boston uh, eons ago and had the good fortune to move out to McLean Hospital but collaborate with my friends at the Massachusetts General Hospital including Maurizio Fava and we started to try and ask the question how is energy metabolism different in the brains of depressed subjects? There had been some prior research suggesting that this area wasn't very metabolically active and so we looked at the basal ganglia and found Something that is never ever supposed to happen, and that is the patients with depressed with depression, if you look at the blue arrow going along indicating beta NTP, which in the brain is ATP, 
you can see that folks with depression in their basal ganglia have almost a 20% reduction in this energetic coin. Uh, one thing that could cause such a problem is if there wasn't as much phosphocreatin available to uh, keep AT levels high. And in fact, when you go up four lines and you look at phosphocreatin, it, it's perfectly normal or, if anything, even a little above average in depression. And so in this case, people who are depressed, when they try and use their basal ganglia, don't have as much available energy. And in general, uh, apart from the fact this was surprising, that sort of made sense because depression has uh, got the subjective components of feeling slow or less energetic. But the great thing about working in Boston is one has wonderful colleagues and fellows. And so uh, Dan Iosi Fescu, who's now at Mount Sinai in New York, came along and said, uh, you shouldn't be so unhappy with your work. Because when we repeated some of the studies with Dan's patients, what he noted, which has been true in every study we've done subsequently, is that if you are depressed and you want to get better, uh, you need to have high levels of brain phosphocreatin. Uh, in this case, Dan was studying individuals who he was treating with thyroid hormone, and the ones who would go on to be responders, you see in this red box, had much higher levels of phosphocreatin in the brain than those who were non-responders or controls. Now, if bad brain chemistry is good for you, do we know enough to know how to cause this kind of change? That is, could we change levels of phosphocreatin and ATP in anybody? Uh, this was a question that was taken on by my colleague in Kyun Liu, who looked at uh, uh, healthy adults using uh, sort of a bodybuilder's creatine uh, uh, regimen, uh, taking a, a bunch of creatine for five days and then slowing down. And here what you see is, from the brain's perspective, this is exactly like having the pattern of brain chemistry that you see in people who are depressed that are going to get better. Phosphocreatin at the top part of the figure goes up, on the right side, and beta NTP or ATP on the, the bottom figure goes down. So we know one pattern of brain chemistry associated with a positive response, and we know uh, how to cause that pattern of response, but have we discovered an antidepressant? Tough to know from uh, the existing literature. The, this is a picture of a fellow. Uh, if you don't know what happened to this tragic soul because you don't live in the United States, uh, this is a gentleman from uh, Europe who started off as a bodybuilder, started taking creatine, and then ended up having to be the governor of California. So, you know, sometimes experimental treatments have outcomes you don't anticipate. But neglecting that, you know, if we wanted to be really serious, the, the place you always end up starting and evaluating a new treatment is with uh, very simple models. And after years of training, uh, my friend in Boston, Bill Carlazon, concluded that I would never, ever be able to correctly assign the emotions as accurately as he can. So you see the, uh, the happy rat, the sad rat, the grumpy rat, and the hopeless rat. And indeed, because these are the same image shown four times, this isn't a very good way to, to figure out whether uh, a compound is antidepressant or not. What we do is something equally implausible, and that is we ask rats to go swimming. And the more they swim, uh, the less likely they are to be depressed. So if you take male rats and feed them for a month with creatine, uh, a natural product found predominantly in proteins and in meats, uh, what you can see is that the male rats get more and more sluggish, sitting on the couch, sort of like uh, my brothers and I watching football on a Sunday afternoon. However, the, the, the female rats have an entirely different response. Uh, they start swimming further, harder, and longer is they have more creatine in their diet. And so this pattern of change in a simple test called the poor salt forced swim test is quite consistent with a powerful antidepressant response. The proof, however, is in the pudding. Uh, in Kyun Liu, my colleague from McLean, had moved back to South Korea. And so we said, well, let's look at whether creatine might be helpful. Uh, he runs a very large neuroscience research program now in Awa University in Seoul. Uh, and Seoul does not have a lot of uh, pharmaceutical industry support nor government support for research, so finding subjects was relatively easy to do. And uh, women of middle age were given a, well, they weren't given a choice, but they were randomized to either receiving Lexapro as an antidepressant or Lexapro plus placebo. Uh, the curve on the left-hand slide, at least as I'm looking at my slides, shows gray boxes of the women uh, and their depression ratings is they got Lexapro. 
Uh, and the blue squares show the women who got Lexapro plus creatine at a dose of uh, 5 grams a day. This funny dotted line here in the middle that I'm trying to point to shows when it is that you know your antidepressant is starting to work. And for the women who are getting creatine, about two and a half weeks into it, they thought they were getting better. The women who were assigned to get just the Lexapro alone, in contrast, it took them about five and a half weeks before they felt they were getting better. Uh, so just a huge increase in the rate of response to this particular antidepressant treatment. Another completely arbitrary convention of, of those of us who do these kinds of clinical trials is to say, uh, you're in remission, that is, you feel like anybody else when your Hamilton depression score is 7 or lower. And so in the right-hand figure, you can see that the women in the blue square group, the creatine group, they were, as a group, in fact, almost entirely in remission after eight weeks, as opposed to the women who were just getting Lexapro who had not yet achieved uh, remission. So a very simple, well-tolerated dietary intervention worked quite well in South Korea. And uh, the first evidence we had that this was going to be a big success was when the women who were getting creatine refused to give it up at the end of the study. And having done clinical trials with a lot of different agents that I thought would have lots of different effects, that was relatively unusual. Um, so this is a talk, though, about Utah. And in 2008, we moved to Utah. And if you've never been to our state, or if you've never been to our state apart from going to the beautiful national parks in the southern part of the state, our greatest natural resource, in contrast to Californians, uh, is we have lots and lots of kids. So the uh, I think we have more kids than any other state uh, in the nation the last time we looked, as well as the highest uh, birth rate. Uh, so what about kids in depression? Well, we know that kids with depression exist, and we know they're hard to treat. So in our first study, we looked for adolescent young ladies who had been depressed for a period of time and had failed to respond to a thorough course of SSRI antidepressants. In this initial cohort of seven women, uh, six of the seven were suicidal, four had dropped out of school, none of them were holding a job. Uh, and by the end of this study, which was just an eight-week study, we were able to reduce depressive symptoms by at least 50%. This was an open-label study, and the child psychiatrist who led it, Dr. Kondo, is, is very charismatic and very uh, uh, supportive of his patients, so we could overinterpret it, but this still looked pretty promising to us. So we then asked a, a sort of a related question, and that is, if you want to treat adolescents who are depressed and get them better, how much creatine do they need? It turns out that they probably only need as little as two grams of creatine. And this is another one of those instances where data begins to match reality in ways that you couldn't really plan for, because in fact, the average adult requires two grams of creatine a day. Um, the body has got some ability to synthesize creatine on its own, but usually not more than a gram, and so vegetarians and vegans are somewhat creatine deficient, an, an effect that can be reduced by taking two grams of creatine a day. Uh, okay, so we've had two positive clinical trials, although one's a small open-label study. As we went along, we began to discover things we should have thought of, and um, one of the, th the things that's true is that depression and anxiety often travel together. Uh, so a population that we study here in the mountains are methamphetamine-using women, who are strangely not all that uncommon here, in part because... Um, Women are pretty hardworking and take care of lots of kids, and methamphetamine does provide a boost in energy. Uh, but it turns out that if you uh, treat women who have methamphetamine dependence and who are depressed with an antidepressant, they sometimes get worse rather than better. If, however, you just give them creatine, as shown here in this slide, in the orange bars, the women who are depressed and using methamphetamine uh, felt much less depressed, but was even more striking was they felt much less anxious, that anxiety and depression are both triggers for uh, continued use of stimulants. Creatine added into um, the regimen of these women who were trying hard not to use methamphetamine if they could help it, had a pretty profoundly uh, notable anti-anxiety effect. Now, that's phosphocreatine, uh, and this is our overall working model. Let's switch gears a little bit and think about serotonin, a neurotransmitter that's been strongly associated with both mood and anxiety disorders. 
And we turn to our friends, the rats, uh, who are often willing to help us learn more. Um, one of the advantages of your physiology department uh, going out of business is you can sneak in in the middle of the night and uh, steal their hardware. It's not exactly how this happened, but the instrument you see in the, the right-hand part of this um, slide is a hypobaric chamber. That is, we can take rats in cages and make them think they're at any altitude we want them to, to think about. And then we can test them to see whether they look depressed or not. So in this particular experience, we took rats up to um, uh, sea level, 4,500 feet, which is about Salt Lake City, 10,000 feet, which is a par about Park City and the ski resorts in Utah, or 20,000 feet, which is some serious hypoxia at very high mountains. And what we found was by in exposing rats to uh, a week of hypobaric hypoxia, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen something called the latency to immobility is going down. That is, the higher they went, the more the women, female rats looked like they were depressed. And when we looked at what behavior they were doing, a very striking change was that they weren't swimming, uh, as opposed to climbing or doing other things uh, in a plexiglass container of water. And this not swimming is entirely consistent with the reductions in serotonin in the brain. And that became a model that we wanted to explore a little bit. It turns out that uh, females, whether you're an animal or a human, uh, tend to have only about half as much serotonin in their brains as males, although it has been noted that women can, in times of uh, real crisis or stress, produce more serotonin than men can uh, in that situation. And this is uh, dating me, but this is a figure that was taken and modified from uh, Eli Lilly's marketing campaign for a drug called Prozac which became the first antidepressant to sell a billion dollars in a year. And what we see here, if we start on the left during the no treatment arm, is, is two nerve cells that are trying to talk to each other using green circles, which is supposed to be serotonin molecules to uh, connect. Uh, when the connection is done, the green molecules get taken up by the pink Lego, and I have no idea why these shapes and colors were selected. But everything works well when one isn't depressed. Uh, when one gets depressed, serotonin transmission goes down, and you can use a medication like Prozac, which is going to block the pink Lego, and you see that even though you're depressed in the middle uh, cartoon, you still have a fair number of, of green serotonin molecules in this space that's called the synapse between two nerve cells. But what happens if you go to altitude and your brain stops making serotonin because of the low oxygen? Well, here you have a big problem because... Uh, even if you block the reuptake of serotonin, if there isn't much serotonin in the brain to work with, you're, you're just not going to have an antidepressant response. And this is something that we think is true of mountain dwellers and potentially responsible for the very high rates of antidepressant use and incomplete response that we see here. Uh, the good news is that um, there's a trick that one can play. Uh, if this were a computer system, you'd call it a workaround. Uh, but uh, I walked three blocks from my office to a GNC store and bought a compound called 5-HTP, or 5-hydroxytryptophan. It turns out that the path to serotonin synthesis in the brain is affected by oxygen, preventing the conversion of tryptophan, uh, this compound that we all experience an overdose on Thanksgiving if we've had uh, dark tur turkey meat. Uh, is n not serotonin itself where the blockade happens. It's in this conversion of tryptophan to 5-hydroxytryptophan. And so we can bypass an oxygen depletion problem uh, in people who are depressed by giving them 5-HTP uh, in addition to anything else they might be taking. 5-HTP uh, is widely available. It's cheap. And importantly, before SSRIs were discovered, there's a pretty serious body of literature that documented the antidepressant effects of 5-hydroxytryptophan. Uh, shown here, with you having no hope whatsoever of reading this table, but if you look at the stars, these were all studies in which double-blind placebo-controlled trials of 5-HTP had antidepressant effects. And um, more often than not, the star is there, suggesting a, a very therapeutic profile for this intervention. Uh, doses that were taken were anywhere from 50 to 300 milligrams of 5-hydroxytryptophan a day, and it worked well. 
uh, and this sort of got lost in the tsunami of the SSRI revolution. Uh, but we decided that uh, you know here in the mountains where we have great problems with depression and we think oxygen may be responsible, what if we give creatine, which works pretty well for improving energy, and 5-HTP together? This is uh, the early results of an open-label trial who's, uh, that's being directed by Brent Caius, one of our junior faculty members who is, of all things, a Caltech graduate with a PhD in philosophy from UCLA who now wants to become a clinical trialist. Uh, so you do meet interesting people in uh, in Utah when you move here. Uh, we've been looking for women who haven't been doing well, who've been depressed for a long time. And as it happens, uh, uh, these were women who on average had been depressed pretty much continuously for an average of six years. And what we see here, looking at 5 grams of creatine and uh, 100 milligrams of 5-HTP twice a day, is that pretty much everybody, despite having depressed, been depressed for years, gets quite a bit better after two months. Uh, if you don't like spaghetti plots, we can show that your Hamilton depression score goes from 18 down to 6 in 8 weeks. Uh, another score used to look at depressive symptoms is called the Madras scale. In the same general pattern, all the spaghetti plots go down. And an initial score of 25 becomes 6.7. Looking at anxiety, which we've become more sensitive to, what we find is, again, a favorable spaghetti plot. And, Ham and uh, Beck anxiety inventory scales of 18 become scores of 7.8 after eight weeks. So a very positive outcome, admittedly in an open-label study, in which we're trying to use our understanding about you know, what's going on with depression and suicide in the mountains to come up with alternative, perhaps better treatments. Uh, now, one of the reasons why this is not something that's been done is there does exist a relatively rare condition called serotonin syndrome, where if you have too much serotonin in your brain, uh, you can get quite a toxic condition. Uh, so in doing the, our open label studies, we've been very careful and very watchful to make sure that we don't see signs of uh, serotonin syndrome, and, and we really haven't. Uh, a couple more things before I stop and take questions. Um, this has been a story about the Inner Mountain West. But as you'll recall, in, in our particular model, the only thing we said was that life in the Inner Mountain West as it relates to changes in uh, mood disorders seems to be related to low oxygen. But there are lots and lots of medical conditions that have uh, hypoxia or low oxygen associated with them. And so we can turn around all of this work and say, you can live in Boston and you can live in San Diego, but if you have a hypoxic condition, maybe all of this is relative, relevant to you. And as one way of testing that, we can look at the prevalence of mood disorders in people with hypoxic conditions. So in this study, we looked at individuals with COPD, asthma, cardiovascular disease, and in each case, there was a significant increase in the odds ratio of depression. Uh, if, in fact, you treat the chronic hypoxic disease, the COPD, effectively, the depression tends to go away. So this is another piece of evidence in favor of the argument that uh, a depression caused by hypoxia may require different treatments. If one compares COPD, asthma, and cardiovascular disease to other serious medical conditions like diabetes, osteoarthritis, and cancer, the ones that are hypoxic have these increased odds ratios, the ones in this case, odds ratios for suicide attempts, medical conditions without hypoxia do not. Uh, COPD increases the odds of suicide, uh, and the more severe your COPD, the more severe your suicidal ideation, and the greater the likelihood of suicide. Uh, asthma, and asthma is very, very interesting uh, because it is a disease that is most commonly noted in childhood and then sometimes resolves. But both current and past asthma are associated with increases in suicide and increases in, uh, in depression. So even if you've gotten better from having had asthma, the experience of having a hypoxic condition has changed your brain in some way, perhaps making you more sensitive to uh, the effects of mood disorders. These slides are pretty similar. Uh, I do have to acknowledge that uh, we credited Ira Katz with thinking about this first. Uh, Simon Young, who's at McGill University in Canada, wrote this wonderful review a couple of years ago. Uh, and he was someone who really put this all together in a unique kind of way, talking about 
how important it would be to uh, look at serotonin levels in individuals with hypoxic conditions. So this is a good paper to look at. Uh, maybe three or four more slides if my clock is right. Uh, Next to Normal uh, is a play about, uh, of all things, bipolar disorder that came from off-Broadway to uh, Salt Lake City. And that's remarkable in and of itself because in Boston we were very, very uh, interested in diagnosing bipolar disorder as accurately and as early as possible. In Salt Lake City, bipolar disorder tends to be a diagnosis of exclusion. And um, typically we'll see patients who've been treated with many uh, types of antidepressants at very high levels before their diagnosis is finally switched. But uh, bipolar disorder is interesting because it's probably the psychiatric disorder most closely associated with bioenergetic impairment. Uh, spectroscopy studies that we've done over the last couple of decades have said, yeah, that this is really a disorder where mitochondria are not working right. So this is a funny kind of story in which we looked at people, well, not funny, haha, but funny, unusual, in that we uh, looked at individuals with different psychiatric disorders who'd gone on to commit suicide and asked at what altitude they had died. And you can see here, those with a mental health diagnosis of bipolar disorder died at the highest altitude compared to individuals, individuals with depression, anxiety, or schizophrenia, uh, suggesting that altitude is especially dangerous for people who have bipolar disorder. More generally, my former colleague, Ann Cataldo, who worked at McLean Hospital, uh, had actually done some electron microscopy to ask, you know, what goes on, not in brain cells, but in lymphocytes from patients with bipolar disorder. And she, in collaboration with other investigators, were able to show that um, even in non-brain cells, uh, taken from individuals with bipolar disorder, uh, the number of mitochondria, the shape of mitochondria, and the location of mitochondria within the cells was wrong, suggesting that bipolar disorder also affects metabolic function. So the mountains are not good for people who are depressed or who may become depressed. They're not so good, and we would argue, for people with bipolar disorder. Can anybody be affected by this? Let's pick someone who or a group of individuals who we would think would not have any effects at all, or at least a, a real resistance to altitude effects. Yes, let's pick U.S. Marines who are hanging out in San Diego, as Marines are wont to do. If one goes up to Northern California, one can come across something called a mountain warfare center at an altitude of 6,400 feet. Uh, the profile of mood states, or POMS, is a scale that's used uh, to collect mood rating data in response to all kinds of different changes. And the point that's made here in this paper by Bardwell et al. is that uh, the Marines living in San Diego look exactly like healthy college males in terms of their ratings of uh, different abnormal mood states. Uh, but by the time they get uh, to the Mountain Warfare Training Center uh, for 30 days, uh, or actually for 90 days of training, they go back to San Diego, and it takes another 90 days before their mood symptoms resolve, that they get... Uh, depressed, particularly with increased fatigue and, de and increased anger. It takes a long time to recover. So even the, the most rigorous amongst us can experience some problem in, in moving to different levels of altitude. Uh, I think for purposes of time, maybe this is a good time for me to stop and see if I've confused you or are there any questions that need to be answered. Well, um, first of all, Perry, thank you. This is a, just an outstanding presentation on, on a scope of work um, that I find fascinating, and I think our audience as well. One of the questions a few people asked has to do with, with what you just described with the Marines, which is um, the effect of somebody moving to a, a higher altitude or reversely the, the effect of somebody who lives in a higher altitude moving to a lower altitude. What, what type of information do you have on that? Well, this hasn't been rigorously studied to a great degree. Um, we've had the experience of recruiting, uh, I guess, about 12 uh, scientists to our research program from the, the coasts. And uh, about a third of them had had uh, either a first episode or a new onset episode of depression or anxiety. Uh, we have wonderful letters that uh, I didn't get out of uh, women who describe just beautifully that uh, a woman from Vermont was driving to uh, 
Colorado to take her daughter to school at the Colorado School of Mines, which is actually a, a wonderful school. And uh, they had an altimeter in their car, and just as she hit 7,000 feet, she had, for the first time ever, a panic attack. Uh, she went down to a lower altitude, felt better. The next day, she still had to get her daughter to college, went up above 7,000 feet, and once again, had a, a panic attack. Uh, so I think this is not uncommon, uh, and the people we've recruited, about a third of the people seem to have had it. Uh, it can be either depression or anxiety. It can be either males or females, which isn't true of our, our rat model. For going down in altitude, the classic paper is sort of a funny paper. It's called Leaving Las Vegas, which may also be a Nicolas Cage movie. Uh, but it turns out that if uh, you're in Las Vegas at 2,000 feet and you move to a lower altitude, your mental health improves. But it's really very difficult to know what to make of that. Uh, we have had a number of letters and conversations with families with individuals with bipolar disorder who have moved into a higher altitude state and began to feel worse and uh, tragically in some instances consider, uh, committed suicide. The advice we tend to give people who are moving to new altitude, even for happy reasons, that is that you, know, you get a new job, you just got married, uh, you're reuniting with your family, is to really make sure you have your lines of connection open to the caregiver who's taking care of your mood disorder, and just keep in mind that your mood can worsen. Uh, the letters that we've gotten for people who have recurrent major depression says it's going to happen really quickly. Uh, that is, you know, it can happen within uh, a day or two. And animal studies that have looked at changes in serotonin and dopamine report that it really is just a couple of hours of exposure to hypoxia before your serotonin levels in brain start to decrease. So some people are not going to have it. Uh, and that's great. And people who come back to Utah after having been away talk about their joy at living in the mountains again. Uh, but for about a third of people, we think there's going to be real trouble in uh, negotiating an increase in altitude. And that awareness of this is something that might happen is actually enormously reassuring to people. Because as you can imagine, if you've just uh, left your friends, left your family, sold your house, moved to a new school district, had to find new friends for your kids, and that's pretty challenging, and if you start to feel crummy, uh, you know, that, that doesn't help things. But knowing that this is something that can happen and it is something that we can treat makes a, a world of difference. Yes, yes, absolutely. Moving can be stressful no matter what. And then if you add on that component, um, there, there's a, a very good question from a person um, and I'm going to give a quick answer to the beginning part of the question, but then ask you for the for the full answer. The question is, if an adolescent states that they're depressed but are not diagnosed with depression, can they consume 5-HTP purchased from GNC? And I'm going to just jump in and quickly say, if an adolescent states that they're depressed, they really should have an, adolescent, uh, an evaluation um, to, to see what's going on and get appropriate treatment, whether it be medicine, talk therapy, a combination of the two, if those are needed. But let me take that question and say to you, how about the use of the 5-HTP um, from a health food store um, to treat depression? Uh, okay, let me give you several different answers to that <laughs> question. First, I, you know, I'd like to echo your, your comment, which I think is, is tremendously important. Anytime you're contemplating doing anything that you think is going to you know, change or improve or potentially make worse uh, a psychiatric condition, you, you really need to talk to a caregiver about it, someone who knows you well and can help you and your family stay alert to any changes that are happening for good or for bad. Uh, that said, in our open-label study with 5-hydroxytryptophan, uh, what we found was um, the first three or four people who completed the study all wanted to stay on it, and they went off and they, uh, they left. The next three or four people that we treated were smarter than the first three or four people they started feeling better at four weeks and figured out that they could just quit the study, buy 5-hydroxytryptophan in a drugstore. It would cost less. It would take less of their time. And... Uh, uh, people really adopted this very quickly and continued to take it. Uh, and that's sort of like what we've seen with creatine treatment of depression. So, yeah, these are things that I know people have used. And, and the general caveat is everybody's different. Don't do anything uh, you know, without someone who's aware of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and can, who can look out for side effects, I think, remains true. Uh, we thought when we developed these natural product treatments for mood disorders, which is one of the, the highest goals for our research group. People would be great and would want to participate in clinical research. And what we find, 
uh, perhaps not surprising, uh, you know, eight years into this experiment here, is that people just want to feel better. And if they can feel better without having to drive to the doctor, they're going to feel better without having to drive to the doctor. Right, right. And the the people taking the 5-HTP in, in, in these studies have a, a, a diagnosed major depression and their only treatment is the 5-HTP or they're also taking an SSRI? Well, we, we thought carefully about that because taking an SSRI might put people in an increased risk for serotonin syndrome. On the one hand, on the other hand, our underlying hypothesis is that um, if you live in a hypoxic area, you're going to have serotonin. So we continued treatment as usual and added on the 5-HTP. Uh, we have really not had uh, any side effects of note so far, but we're only about 15 subjects into this, and we're about to transition into a double-blind study just to make sure that uh, Brent Caius isn't charming people into being better. And the um, for people who are not living at a high altitude, what would be what would be the thought process for that? Well, we had asked this a lot about creatine, uh, and our trial we first did with creatine in Seoul. If you've ever been to Seoul, you, you know that it's pretty much right at sea level. That worked pretty well. Uh, our thought about 5-HTP uh, not at altitude is that you would probably want to start cautious, cautiously, that rather than necessarily taking 100 milligrams twice a day, start taking 50 milligrams twice a day, and make sure that someone is looking out for you. Um, if you add up all of the different hypoxic conditions uh, that one can experience from sleep apnea to COPD to asthma to coronary artery disease to um, um, much more many more rare disorders, uh, we calculate that something like 45% of the U.S. population may be affected by a hypoxic condition. And we think the real impact of this work isn't so much going to be uh, improving outcomes in Utah, which is a good thing and which we're already doing, but really asking the question of if you have this particular medical comorbidity, should treatment be different? Uh, and so I would argue that for many, many people, even if you don't happen to live in a Rocky Mountain state, uh, uh, these findings are going to be of, of consequence because hypoxia is so prevalent. Yeah, I, I think that's a, an important point. And I want to reiterate your, your earlier point, which is our conversation today and your presentation today about these types of treatments that are still being studied. People shouldn't try to go out and do them on their own. They can discuss it with their own psychiatrist or other mental health professional, but this is not the kind of thing that you want to just go out and do on your own. I really advise against that. I think building in a layer of safety uh, just to make sure that you're not going to have an idiosyncratic reaction to something new would serve anyone well. Right, good. Well, Perry, I want to thank you for an outstanding presentation. Uh, also, thank you for the work that you've been doing, the work you're going to continue to do. Um, it certainly is fascinating and um, already is helping people and I think will help many, many more people over time. And it's an example of how um, you can move from basic research to translational research to clinical research that can really help people's lives. So thank you for, for all that you've been doing. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about our research. Good. Well, thanks. Um, I, I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or friend, visit the webinar page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Jacqueline Crawley, who's a member of our scientific council and is the Robert E. Chasen Chair in Translational Research at the MIND Institute and Professor for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California Davis School of Medicine, will present a webinar entitled Autism, Understanding the Causes and Developing Effective Treatments. This will take place on Tuesday, August 9th, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. So we're done.